So, as you've heard, this, this is a very special uh, opportunity for me to acknowledge uh, our debt to our uh, recipient this year. The, the, we established the Mental Health Research Advocacy Award in 2006 and awarded it at that time to Tom Kirk. Uh, and then over the years, a series of really uh, exceptional people who've in their own, each in their own way advocated on behalf of uh, people with mental illness. And it's my tremendous uh, pleasure to uh, introduce our award recipient this year, Mr. Andrew Solomon. Andrew has been a tremendous friend of people with mental illness. As, as you heard uh, Bob just say that, that he, he spoke about his own experience and the experience of others with depression in a way that has made the experience of mental illness um, deeply understandable. Andrew started his career at Yale uh, after graduating from Horace Mann and went on to get training uh, in, in English at Cambridge and, uh, and, and to continue his training at Cambridge. Um, and he has, in his career, his writing career, has asked some very fundamental questions. One, how can we understand and accept ourselves in whatever, for whomever we turn out to be? How can we understand and accept our others, including our spouses and children, recognizing that between any two people that there is at some level a, a, a breach that has to be crossed to understand and accept that other person? And, and profoundly and deeply uh, uh, related to the mission of, of our conference this morning, how does, how does brain function, how do psychiatric disorders, how does all that inform each of these two earlier challenges? And these are deep and important questions that we as individuals, as people, among people need to wrestle with. Andrew's writings have been a journey of, uh, it has seemed to me to be a journey of self-discovery, exploration, and communication. His first novel in 1994, A Stone Boat, was uh, a book that dealt with uh, a, a young man's struggle to uh, understand and accept himself, particularly the issue, raising the issue of homosexuality, but also the, his relationship with his mother who was dying of cancer, also a, undoubtedly an extraordinarily painful and difficult uh, issue in, in Andrew's own life. In some ways, Andrew's impact has been enormous with regards to uh, the Noonday Demon, a, a classic by any, any standards, the recipient of the National Book Award, and whole host of other, other prizes, and only some of which I list here, but which for many people, and I, I have prescribed this book as part of the treatment of depression to many people who, who don't understand that the experience that they have is an experience that is shared with many other people in our society, uh, is a powerful message about the experience and the hope for people with depression. I'm just going to mention two quotes. Andrew, uh, so Andrew will have the opportunity to say other things about, about his personal experience and his writings. But I just want to say two things, two examples of his deep understanding, which, uh, which I find so useful when I talk to people with depression, which is that the opposite of depression is not happiness, but vitality and, um, and life. And, uh, and, and he writes that his life is vital even when, when sad, that, that depression is not just being sad about things, but depression is, is having some vital force sapped from your life, um, and that treatment is about restoring that capacity. And the other has been the forthright, honest, and reasonable way in which he writes about treatment. So for example, about medications. So I love this quote that says, I usually end up by saying that I am on medication. Still, people ask, but you seem fine, to which I reply that I am fine, in part because of medication. So how long do you expect to go on taking this stuff, people ask. 
When I say that I will be on medication indefinitely, people stare at me with alarm. But this is a struggle that everybody that I've treated wrestles with, which is, are medications a punishment for having a mental illness, or are medications a path to living a full life? And, and that challenge, that, those, that fundamental different way of viewing medications in the treatment of, of psychiatric disorders is critical. Because people often think that the, the, the major challenge in psychiatry is about prescribing medications. And, and there is that art of, of psychopharmacology. But I, it's always seemed to me that, that, that recovery is something that people need to own and, for themselves. And that, that um, it's not about the prescribing, it's about the seeking of those paths, those opportunities that enable people to, to be on the path of recovery. And so medications are not things that doctors prescribe, they are tools that patients use in ways to promote their own recovery. And that idea about, about the treatment of psychiatric disorders is a profound and important thing to understand. Andrew has once again Hit, it out of, hit the ball out of the park with his, his new book, Far From the Tree. And for those of you who haven't read it, you can get a copy upstairs, uh, which, is, which is a deeply profound book about understanding other people, and particularly when your child or a family member, or people, important people in your lives, um, differ in some ways from your expectations. Um, whether because of their sexuality, because of their psychiatric disorder, because of other problems. And it's a wonderful book, a, a really exceptional book. Andrew's capacity as a communicator and writer has, has thrown him onto the national stage in many, many important ways and made him one of the most important vo voices in our society and in the world about, about mental illness. So it's quite likely, if you've been following uh, the, the public discourse on psychiatric disorders, that you have, if you, even if you haven't read one of his books, that you've encountered him in some way or another. And I presume that's why one of the reasons that for this conference, we've had 430 people sign up for it, which is the most of any of our 22 conferences that we've had. I'd like to express one other particular debt of gratitude. <laughs> one is to uh, Andrew's husband, John, but also because Andrew helped me to appreciate my own and my, our own department's struggle to understand and accept other people. And, uh, and I have asked him, and he has agreed to, and has, has already begun to serve as a special advisor for me and the department um, about uh, LGBTQ uh, issues, and which has been already very helpful to me and very helpful to our trainees. Um, uh, I, it's been a, 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 Andrew's given grand rounds in our department and he's been met with our, 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 our student psychiatrists. And it's a remarkable thing to see them sit around a table with him and ask him all the questions that they didn't feel that they could ask anybody else about how to talk to other people with uh, psychiatric problems and uh, with uh, issues of uh, gender, gender identity. So really, I, I thank him very much for taking on this role within our department, within our field, and within our society. And, and it's for that reason, that I invite him up to the stage to receive his award uh, today. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to...
I'd like to read the, the plaque which says Mental Health Research Advocacy Award presented to Andrew Solomon by the Department of Psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine in recognition of his courageous efforts to raise public awareness and to reduce stigma associated with mental illness, his national leadership in the effort to ensure parity for the treatment of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender mental health issues, and his visionary proposal for a national initiative to generate research breakthroughs for psychiatric disorders. Thank you. Why don't we uh, have a picture? Yes. And then, and then. Well, I want to thank the department and Yale for um, this fantastic honor. Um, I want to thank Robert for his kind words and John for his extraordinary words. Um, and I want to say that it's disconcerting seeing your whole life in photo montage, um, <laughs> seeing all of your best and brightest uh, moments ranged one after the next up there. So that was, that was very exciting. Uh, and I also will just anecdotally tell the story. When I was an undergraduate at Yale, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, last year's award recipient, was coming up to give a lecture, which was going to be delivered in the law school auditorium. And I happened to have gone to uh, elementary school and high school with her son. And I therefore knew her as um, Joel's mom. So I thought, <laughs> wow, there's this celebrity coming on campus. And I thought, I'm going to have my little moment of showing how glamorous my life is. And so I. Um, I went to the lecture and I greeted her and she came rushing down from the stage and gave me a big hug. And for the next six months, people said, so what was the disorder for which you saw Dr. Westheim? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, so, um, even in purely non-religious terms, homosexuality represents a misuse of the sexual faculty. It is a pathetic little second-rate substitute for reality, a pitiable flight from life. As such, it deserves no glamorization, no rationalization, no sophistry about simple differences in taste, and above all, no pretense that it is anything but a pernicious sickness. That's Time Magazine in 1966, when I was three years old. And in the last year, the President of the United States has come out in support of gay marriage. And I was left to wonder how that had happened, how an illness had become an identity and what it meant for there to be a shift uh, of that kind and on this almost unimaginable scale. Um, how the life that I have, you saw, I'm sorry, I keep bumping this and somehow causing other slides to show. How um, uh, my marriage, a photo of which you saw up above, became possible in the course of my lifetime. When I was uh, about six years old, my mother and my brother and I went to a shoe store. And when we had finished uh, having our shoes fitted, the salesman offered each of us a balloon to take home. My brother wanted a red balloon, and I wanted a pink balloon. <laughs> and my mother reminded me that um, I really would prefer to have a blue balloon. <laughs> and I said, no, I really wanted the pink balloon. And she said that I should bear in mind that my favorite color was blue. Um, <laughs> the fact that my favorite color now is blue, but I'm still gay, is evidence both of my mother's influence and its, um, and its limits. <laughs> when I was growing up, my mother used to say frequently, the love for your children is unlike any other feeling in the world, and people don't know what it's like until they have children. And at first when she said that, I was deeply moved and felt very much complimented. It meant that having my brother and me in her life had opened up new emotional territory for her and joyous new emotional territory. And then as I got older, 
her saying that filled me with anxiety because I thought, I'm gay and I don't think I'll have children. And in the time that followed, after I'd come out when she said that, I would get angry about it and say, that's not the way my life is going, that's not who I am, and I want you to stop saying that. About 20 years ago, my editors at the New York Times Magazine asked me to write an article about deaf culture. And I was very taken aback by the assignment because I hadn't known there was any such thing as deaf culture. I had thought of deafness as something that was entirely a disadvantage, a painful one, people who couldn't hear, what could we do to help them? And then I went out and began researching the deaf world, a world united by the shared use of sign language. And I went to deaf clubs, and I went to deaf theater, and I saw performances of deaf poetry. I even went to the Miss Deaf America contest in Nashville, Tennessee, where people complained about that blurry southern signing. And the deeper I got into the world of the deaf, the more I became persuaded that it was, in fact, a culture. It wasn't my culture, and I didn't particularly want to join it, but it seemed to me to have as much of a claim on being a culture as gay culture, or Jewish culture, or deaf culture, or Ivy League culture. Um, and I felt that I had to respect the fact that for the people who were there, it was a culture. And then I found out that most deaf children are born to hearing parents, that those hearing parents tend to prioritize functioning in the hearing world, and that many of those deaf people arrive at a sense of cultural identity only in adolescence when they begin to meet other people who are deaf. And I thought how interestingly parallel that was to the gay experience of often having parents who would like you to be straight and of finding meaning in the larger community of gay people only in adolescence or thereafter. And then a friend of a friend of mine had a daughter who was a dwarf. And as she began talking about her experience and her anxieties, should I bring my daughter up and tell her she's just like everyone else but short? Or should I get involved with the little people of America and attempt to bring her up with a strong sense of dwarf identity? I thought, there it is happening again. And I thought if this tension between an illness and an identity has existed for gay people, has existed for deaf people, and clearly is part of what is being considered in looking at this, uh, this child who is a dwarf, then who else is out there waiting to join our gladsome throng? And I thought it was striking to me that there are really two kinds of identity. There are what I've called vertical identities, which are passed down generationally from parent to child. So one's ethnicity, one's nationality usually, one's language in general, often one's religion. These are things that one shares with one's parents. You could say that it's difficult in the United States as it's currently construed to be African American, our post-racial presidency notwithstanding, but there's nobody doing research into how to ensure that the next generation of children born to African Americans come out with yellow hair and creamy skin. The qualities that are, that are vertical and passed down generationally, nobody tries to correct. But then there's also such a thing as horizontal identity. These are identities people have when they're different from their parents. Identities that have to be learned as identities by mixing with a peer group. So the ones I've talked about, gayness and deafness and dwarfism, and in my current book, autism, Down syndrome, schizophrenia, being a prodigy, which is also something people don't tend to have in common with their parents, being a criminal, being transgender, and so on. These are all identities that get learned as identities through interaction with a peer group, and I've therefore called them horizontal identities. A lot of the time, people with horizontal identities find that their families want to cure them, starting as soon as the identity manifests itself. And so they're constantly struggling with that idea of cure. Um, and they often, in the course of doing that, confuse, as I myself did at one point, deficits in acceptance from families who are troubled by the ways their children are different with deficits in love. Often, I find that parents love their children all the way through, but struggle to accept them. And often, those same children experience that as a lack of love. So I became interested in that tension between love and acceptance. Acceptance of any identity condition has to occur at three levels. It occurs with self-acceptance, with family acceptance, 
and with the larger social acceptance. And I was interested in the way that families end up mediating between the self and the society and end up defining the extent to which um, acceptance really does set in. One of the dwarfs whom I got to know and whose family I got to know was someone named Clinton Brown. And Clinton had, was born with a condition called diastrophic dwarfism. And when he was born, the doctor said to his mother, that uh, he was never going to learn to walk or talk, that he wasn't going to live for very long, and that she and her husband might as well leave him in the hospital so that he could die quietly there. And his mother said, no, it's my child, and I'm going to take my child home. And even though she didn't have a lot of um, economic or educational resources, she found the best doctor for dealing with the bone issues in diastrophic dwarfism, and she took him in for treatment, and in the uh, course of his first 10 years, he had more than 30 surgical procedures, as a result of which he is, in fact, able to walk. And while he was stuck in the hospital going through all of that treatment, his family um, uh, decided that they would work with him on his school work. And there were tutors at the hospital who worked with him. And he decided he might as well focus on his school work. And he did very well with it. And he ended up being the first person in his family to go to college. And when he was there, he went to a college not very far from where his parents lived in, um, uh, on Long Island. And one day, his mother was driving home, and she saw the specially fitted car that he had learned to drive parked uh, at the um, uh, parking lot of a bar. And she thought, oh my god, he's three feet tall. They're six feet tall. Two beers for them is four beers for him. She said, I knew I couldn't go in there and interrupt him, but I nonetheless, I went home and I left him seven messages on his cell phone saying, call me and let me know you're okay. She said, and then I thought, if someone had told me when he was born that my future concern would be that he'd go out drinking and driving with his college buddies, I'd have been so glad to have that problem. And I said to her, what do you think you did to make Clinton into himself? I said, what did you do? And she said, what did I do? I loved him, that's all. Clinton just always had that light in him. And we were lucky enough to be the first to see it there. I'm going to quote one more magazine from the 1960s to you. This is the Atlantic Monthly in 1968. There is no reason to feel guilty about putting away a Down syndrome child whether it is put away in the sense of hidden in a sanitarium or in a more responsible, lethal sense. It is sad, yes, dreadful, but it carries no guilt. True guilt arises only from an offense against a person, and a Downs is not a person. That was in a liberal publication, um, and it was less than 50 years ago. And while the progress in gay rights is discussed a lot, in fact, has captured headlines across the news media recently, the progress in disability rights has been quieter. It hasn't gone as far. The acceptance isn't as great. But people are shocked now to hear how strongly that was the attitude. One of the families I interviewed while I was doing this work, Tom and Karen Robards, have a son with Down syndrome born in the uh, 1980s. And when he was born, uh, his parents had no expectation of anything like this happening to them. They were young. They were hard-charging Wall Street types, Harvard Business School grads. And they didn't know what to do. And as their son David grew up, they began looking at the educational opportunities that were available to them and found them sadly lacking. And so they, with a few other parents, started a tiny, tiny center called the Cook Center to provide some education for people with Down syndrome. And as they continued to work um, at the Cook Center, they began to come up with more and more educational strategies for people with Down syndrome. People with Down syndrome now live three times as long as they did when that quote ran in the Atlantic Monthly. They have educational attainments that were previously unimaginable. Some are actors, some are writers, some are living independently as adults. And 
when I talked to the Robards about their experience, which had been so intense and which had included helping to devise some of these educational strategies, I wondered whether they regretted having had to do this. I wondered whether they wished they didn't have a child with Down syndrome, whether they wished they could make it go away. And Tom said, well, for David, I wish I could make it go away. Because for David, it's a very difficult way to be, and I would like David to have a better and easier life. And his wife, Karen, said, I'm with Tom. For David, I would like to make it go away. But speaking for myself, while I would never have believed 23 years ago when he was born that I could come to such a position, speaking for myself, I have grown so much from this and changed so much and learned so much and had so much more purposeful a life that speaking for myself, I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. We're at a moment when things are getting better for all of these conditions, when people with Down syndrome are doing things they never did before, when there's respect for the experience of dwarfs, when deaf culture has been accepted and sign language is being taught um, as one of the most popular languages in American universities today. And yet, at the same moment, we're approaching a time when we may eliminate all of these conditions. We're approaching a time when cochlear implants for the deaf, a surgical device that gets implanted in the brain and allows a facsimile of hearing, are becoming the common law of the land. A pharmaceutical company has just announced the development of a drug called, for the moment, BMN-111, which has been used in mice with the achondroplasia gene, the most common gene for dwarfism. And it's been demonstrated that the mice who are treated grow to typical size. Trials in humans are just beginning. We live in a time when blood tests to detect Down syndrome early, early, early in pregnancy are becoming closer and closer to being a common reality, and when people will more and more have the opportunity to end those pregnancies if they are so inclined at a very early stage, um, except in North Dakota. Um, <laughs> and I've sometimes thought that the, uh, that the whole narrative, it's a bit like those opera plots in which the hero realizes he loves the heroine at the exact moment that she expires on the sofa. <laughs> the cures are there. The question of when, whether, and how to use them is there. And the question of what they mean to the people who are cured is also there. Jim Sinclair, an autistic adult and activist, said, when parents say, I wish my child did not have autism, what they're actually saying is, I wish the autistic child I have did not exist and that I had a different, non-autistic child instead. <laughs> Read that again. This is what we hear when you mourn over our existence. This is what we hear when you pray for a cure, that your greatest wish is that someday we will cease to be and strangers you can love will move in behind our faces. It's a very extreme way of talking about the wish to cure people, but it reflects the persistent reality that there are many people who feel undermined by those efforts toward cure and who have a strong sense of cultural identity attached to their conditions. Is it an illness? Is it an identity? Can we talk about the autism that someone like Jim Sinclair has that allows him to be an activist in the same sentence as the experience of a child who's banging his head relentlessly against the wall? It's very difficult to know where we come down. I believe in the medical progress, and I believe in the social progress, and I believe that the intersection of them is and will remain highly problematical. I wanted to look at the idea that this experience of feeling disaffected from your own child and bewildered by your own child could take place not only in the context of the genetics with which your child was born, but also in the context of what your child does. And in writing about crime, I interviewed the family of Dylan Klebold, who was one of the perpetrators of the Columbine Massacre. And at the end of our first long weekend of interviews, they had resisted talking for an extended period, but when they finally began telling their story, they couldn't stop. I said to his parents, sitting around the kitchen table, Sunday night, I said, if Dylan were here now, is there anything you'd want to ask him? And his father said, there sure is. I'd want to ask him what the hell he thought he was doing. And his mother looked down 
and she thought for a minute, and then she looked up and said, I would ask him to forgive me for being his mother and never knowing what was going on inside his head. And a couple of years later, she and I were having dinner, and she said, when it first happened, I used to wish I had never had children. If Tom and I hadn't crossed paths at Ohio State, we wouldn't have married, we wouldn't have had children, and this terrible thing wouldn't have happened. But over time, I've come to feel for myself that I love the children I had so much that even with this pain, I wouldn't wish to imagine a life without them. When I say that, I'm speaking of my pain, not of the pain of other people. But while I recognize that it would have been better for the world if Dylan had never been born, I've decided that it would not have been better for me. At one point, she described to me being on a train and talking to a stranger who was sitting next to her. And she said, I could feel it coming. The questions, how many children do you have? And tell me more about you. And I felt I had to tell him who I was. And who I was and who I am forever now is Dylan's mother. It's her identity. I was struck by the idea that all of these parents so loved these problematical children. And I wondered over and over again what it meant for them to keep saying that they were so thrilled to have the children they had, that they were so enraptured by these children who had so many difficulties. And I thought about how odd that was. And then I thought about the odd reality that all of us love the children that we have. And most of us want to hold on to them. If some glorious angel suddenly descended through my living room ceiling, and offered to take away my children and exchange them for other children, better, funnier, nicer, more polite. <laughs> I would cling to the children I have, and I would pray away that spectacle. And the experience of dealing with difference, that pervasive experience of dealing with difference, is actually one that occurs all over the place, and that occurs even in families who aren't dealing with such extreme situations, whose children aren't criminals, and whose children aren't dwarfs, and whose children aren't deaf or even gay, that all of us um, are, in effect, dealing with some degree of difference. Because I have yet to meet a parent who has not occasionally looked at his or her own children and said, where did you come from? Um, <laughs> And I think in the same way that we test flame retardant pajamas in an inferno to ensure they won't catch fire when our child reaches across the stove, so looking at these more extreme circumstances illuminates the common experience of parenting. I often think of the line that was from one of the people I interviewed whose child um, with severe disabilities, unable to walk or talk, died when a caregiver left him alone in a bathtub where he slipped down into the water and drowned. And his mother said at his funeral, let me bury here the rage I feel to have been twice robbed, once of the child I wanted and once of the son I loved. Differences which seem so isolating and which are isolating individually, there are only so many people who are dealing with schizophrenia. There are only so many families confronting autism. There are only so many families even of people who commit crimes. Families who are confronting these difficulties um, as long as they think of themselves as having something in common only with other people confronting the same difficulty, those families will find themselves in small, isolated silos of experience. But if we recognize that everyone is grappling with these things, then we'll find that difference is actually what unites us and that the negotiation of difference within a family is unbelievably powerful and is something that most families at one level or another have in common. In the course of the time that I was working on this research, I decided to have a family. And people kept saying to me, how could you have the courage to have children in the midst of a book about everything that can go wrong? <laughs> but I said that for me, it wasn't a book about everything that could go wrong. It was a book about how much love persisted even when everything did go wrong. So my husband, John, whose picture you saw earlier, is the biological father of two children with some lesbian friends in Minneapolis. 
I am the father of a child with a Yale classmate who had been through a divorce but wanted to have a family, and the mother and daughter live in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, John and I have a son who lives with us all the time, of whom I am the biological father, and uh, for whom our surrogate was Laura, one of the lesbian mothers of John's two biological children. So <laughs> the shorthand is five parents of four kids in three states. Um, <laughs> and it's a modern set of arrangements. I confront all the time, sometimes even in print, people who think that the existence of my family somehow undermines the strength of theirs. And my position is that subtractive models of love don't work, only additive ones. And that in the same way that species diversity is necessary to sustain the planet, so this diversity of love is necessary to sustain the ecosphere of kindness. When our son was born, he came out bouncing, yelling, healthy, and the next day, the pediatrician wanted to talk to me for a minute. And she said, your son is not extending his legs correctly. And I said, oh. And she said, we're concerned that that may reflect brain damage of some kind. And then she said, and insofar as he's extending them, he's doing so asymmetrically which could suggest some sort of mass or tumor in his brain. And I felt an immediate feeling of despair. And she said, we'd like to do some CAT scans and an MRI and see what's going on. And so we took our child, who was not yet 24, year, 24, days, 24 hours old, um, through um, to have all of these tests. And my immediate response was the illness response. I thought, I've been writing about how many people find meaning in having disabled children, and I want to protect my child, and I don't want to join their number. But in the back of my mind also was the identity response. I thought whoever he is is who he will be, and it will be his identity, and it will be my identity too, and I have to be ready to take those identities. And I thought, as I worried, as we went from test room to test room, of how my mother had said, the love for your children is unlike any other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. And I realized she had been right. At the end of five hours, they discovered that there was nothing wrong with his brain. And by then, he was extending his legs correctly. <laughs> and the pediatrician said he had probably had a cramp. Um, <laughs> But children ensnared me, I think, the minute I connected fatherhood with loss. Encountering so much strange love, I fell into its bewitching patterns and saw how splendor can illuminate even the most abject vulnerabilities. I had witnessed and learned the terrifying joy of unbearable responsibility. I had seen how it conquers everything else. Sometimes, I had thought the parents I was interviewing were fools, enslaving themselves to a lifetime's journey with their thankless children, trying to breed identity out of misery. And I was startled to find that my research had built me a plank and that I was ready to join them on their ship. Thank you.